in um, ethics in healthcare delivery. And today we have our speaker, Dr. Dr. Muhammad Ghali, Professor of Islam and Biomedical um, Ethics from HBKU. And he'll be talking about genetics, genomics, and Islamic studies. Uh, sorry, Islamic ethics. Um, before we start today, I would like to draw your attention to our CPD website. So on the website, you'll see all of our up and coming events. So this, as I mentioned, is the second in a three part series. The, the final part of the series will be next Sunday, uh, where we'll be talking about interprofessional ethics towards working, working towards a common framework. So I'd like you to, to register for this event and look forward to wel welcoming you. And next week as well will be the beginning of our diabetes series. This is a six part series that will be delivered by local and international experts. And there's something here for everyone. Um, so this series has been designed uh, to meet the learning objectives or the, the learning needs of all healthcare professionals. So it's been catered towards a very general sort of like learning needs. Um, as well, we've made some up updates to our processes. So we attended yesterday's uh, on uh, Sunday's event, apologies. You, you will be able to watch the recording online by just clicking on the recording. Um, you'll be able to stream the whole event on YouTube. To claim your um, CPD certification, you can just click on the link uh, where it's the CPD evaluation. That will take you to a series of questions you'll be required to complete, and then your certificate will be sent to the email that you registered with within seven days of the event. Um, but please note that these links are only available for seven days after the event has occurred. So um, if you have attended the event and you want to claim your certification, please do that as soon as possible. Um, as well, at this point, I'd like to welcome our viewers on YouTube. So thank you for joining us on YouTube. We'll be mon monitoring the chat function throughout, both on WebEx and, and YouTube. So please contribute to the discussion, um, ask your questions. I'll be, uh, I'll be receiving your questions and putting them to Dr. Muhammad during, during the presentation uh, where, where there's an appropriate gap. Um, as well, I would like just to bring your attention to our monthly newsletter. So this is our CPG newsletter that comes out in the first week of each month and gives you an update of our activities and what's coming up. In, the, in uh, March of the newsletter, we would like to uh, include the participants' experience. So if you're happy to share your experience with attending our event, um, and then please get, us, please get in contact with us um, once today's event has, has finished. So that's uh, my introduction. So without uh, any more delay, I'll now hand over to um, Dr. Mohammed, and he'll be beginning the presentation. So Dr. Mohammed, let's make you the presenter. Okay, you know. Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you so much, Dr. Zakaria, and uh, thanks for the CPD group and for all the colleagues uh, who are behind us. And thanks for the kind invitation and for having me. It's my great pleasure to be with you uh, this evening uh, talking about Islamic uh, bioethics in the ethical issues raised by genetics and more particularly uh, genomics. Um, um, I, I have seen um, um, a disclaimer, and I, I see this in uh, most of these uh, meetings. So I start by making another disclaimer. Uh, th this this uh, lecture today is based on material that I collected uh, during my work in uh, our uh, MA uh, program. In applied Islamic ethics, I teach there a course on Islamic bioethics where I extensively talk about these points. So I benefited from discussions uh, with my students uh, and my colleagues while working on this and teaching this course for a couple of years now. So uh, I hereby acknowledge the students and uh, my colleagues in the, in the program. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, this is not a copy and paste uh, thing from uh, one of my lectures. So uh, there is still uh, some intellectual innovation in what I will present uh, today. Uh, these are the learning objectives <clears throat> that we will uh, go through today. I suppose you had them already uh, communicated to you. 
And this is the outline of uh, my lecture today. We will have three main components. Uh, first one is introductory remarks. And the second part of the lecture will be about the discussions of the rel religious scholars on the genomic revolution um, as a new concept in, in the field of genomics, as a newly introduced concept in our modern life and what to do as Muslims, whether individuals or governments, uh, should we join this genomic revolution? Should we be part of, should not we be part of, etc.? And uh, why would uh, why sh shouldn't we join if this is our position? And why should we join if, if, if this will be our position? And then we will talk about an applied example <clears throat> uh, that has been made uh, possible thanks to the genomic revolution, uh, which has attracted so much attention, uh, especially uh, since October, November 2018 with the birth of the first gene edited twin babies in china with dr hay so we will uh, discuss about this 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 one of the very recent discussions uh, not only in islamic bioethics but in general mainstream secular bioethics how far can we do um, go with uh, editing our own genomes or those of our um, existing or prospective children so we will have three um, uh, main components. After each component, uh, uh, please feel free to ask any questions that you have in mind through the Q and A um, session um, uh, um, uh, item or through chat. I suppose, Dr. Zakaria. So, uh, Dr. Zakaria will take care of your questions, and then we will have a discussion about it. Uh, but even if I am uh, doing one in the middle of one of these three components. Uh, that compromise my lecture today, and there is something unclear, and you cannot follow further because of the unclarity in one point or in a specific term, uh, please feel free to raise your question immediately without waiting till the end of the component. Uh, so um, uh, this is the kind of uh, contract between you and me uh, that we will talk about these aspects. So hopefully, inshallah, we will be able to cover them all. And after this, uh, we will have an extended session for uh, questions and answers, uh, whether about the lecture or about genomics in general or about Islamic bioethics in general. I'll be very happy uh, to um, respond to your questions as much as I can. There are for sure issues in which I have to say that I don't know yet or I will check further. We'll see how far uh, we can go. So <clears throat> I will start with the first uh, part of this lecture about the introductory uh, remarks. <clears throat> uh, in, the, in the 19th century, especially in the second half of the 19th century, we witnessed uh, a very significant shift in biomedical sciences. Uh, uh, this is how we used to look at our bodies. I mean, by we here, uh, I mean uh, patients or humans in general, but more particularly physicians. Uh, uh, so we are um, a body uh, consisting of organs, tissues, etc. Things that we can see, things that we can touch. Uh, some uh, some of these things we can see by looking at the person directly, like eyes, uh, like uh, arms, like legs, uh, like knees, etc. And uh, some stuff needs uh, either uh, specific tools or we see them uh, when we uh, do anatomy for the body after death, like the stomach, the heart, the lung, the internal organs. Uh, but this is how we see uh, the human body. And when we have um, a malfunction, when our health condition is not optimal, uh, then we know that something goes wrong with these uh, uh, with this body as we look at it yeah? and as we see it and as we perceive it. I want you to think with me <clears throat> to use our imagination a little bit and to use uh, the following metaphor. This uh, way of looking at the human body, we will compare it with a printed file. 
that we have a, a, a Word document that we have printed. We got it from the printer and we start reading it. When we read this printed document, uh, uh, we come across sometimes mistakes. So, for instance, instead of uh, saying, I go to school, I will find I, I go to uh, 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 SCAL, for instance. Then we know that this AA should be OO. What we will do <clears throat> is that we will use the pin on the printed document and we fix it. So we delete the two A's and replace them with the two O's. Remember this metaphor that this is how we dealt with the body. We have a, a, a body consisting of organs. We have something wrong with the health condition of this body. Then we fix it in the same way that we fix the, the, the skull, the mistake in the skull that should be school. We take this body and we see, for instance, this double A is in the heart or in the brain or in the arm. We make a surgery, we give a medicine, etc., and then we fix it. This is how we used to look at our bodies uh, up to the eve of the uh, genetic and genomic revolution. Uh, what happened, what did the genomic revolution do to us is that we start to look at it this way. It's not anymore the organs, what we call the phenotype, the things that we see, that we observe with our own eyes, but there is a digital version residing in our human bodies at the molecular level and this digital version is the original one, not the printed uh, E4 or the printed Word document that we had in mind. So remember the metaphor of the word I go to skull that should be school. We correct it with our pin and we made it two O's instead of two A's to make it correct. But if we try to print this document again, even 100 times, we will always see skull and not school. Why? Because the correction we made, we made it in the printed version, not the original one on the computer. In the, in the, in the 20th century and towards the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, we had access to this digital version on the computer like the one who was using all the time the printed version now could get into the office, the computer had the password and could see the digital version and now can change the double A into double O and then finished. And you don't have to use the pen all the time whenever you print this document to make it a correct one. So we started the, to see the human body as a book not as a, 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 a physical body with organs that we can see and we can touch, but as a book that we can read. And when the uh, Human Genome Project in the United States was, uh, came to a successful end in 2001, by the beginning of this 20th century, our century, and fully completed later on in 2003, um, uh, uh, the Francis Collins, the, the director of the project, he called it Book of Life, that sequencing the genome, the, sequ the first human genome sequenced, he called it Book of Life, and he used this metaphor. Uh, 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 and he said that uh, this uh, book is consisting of so uh, a couple of billions of letters, these billions of letters, if we put them in a book and we start uh, reading this book day and night without stopping, without eating, without sleeping, it will take us more than 30 years to read, just to read the letters of the book, etc. So uh, 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 um, the genomic revolution changed uh, how we look at our human bodies. And uh, the body is the subject of medicine. Uh, this is the subject of medicine. If I go sick, what, cho what should I show to the, to the physician and what will the physician check and diagnose is my body. So if we change it, uh, how we perceive the body, it means that many, many things will change. 
And uh, the people who were working on the Human Genome Project, which started roughly in the 1990, they were aware of this, that this is not only a medical issue, <clears throat> and this is not only a scientific issue, but this is a moral and philosophical issue that will have impact on how we perceive ourselves as humans, on how we think uh, uh, what make us distinctively human, uh, how we relate to each other as members of the human species, etc., uh, etc. Et it, it will have huge impact. That's why a substantial part of the, uh, of the budget allocated to uh, the Human Genome Project was allocated for the so-called LC program. Uh, LC, the acronyms of ELSNI, uh, Ethical, Legal, and Social Implications Program. And this was uh, um, one of, if not the most expensive uh, bioethical project in human history with this, uh, with this budget. And normally speaking, normally speaking, uh, the, the normal course of events in bioethics is that we have the scientific project. And once we have problems, bioethicists would come on board. When we have problems, if we don't have problems, we will not interfere. So usually science starts and then ethics will join only if there is a problem. With this project, it started 1990. And the ethical project parallel to it started in 1990, exactly the same time, which is quite strange. But this is again because the very project itself meant a, a change in our perception of our very humanness. What does it mean to have a human body? It will be different and it will not be the same anymore. So this is a very important point that we need to grasp when we go further with the challenges that will come up with this genomic revolution and the discussions, um, especially the bioethical discussions, especially within the Islamic tradition. Uh, just to give you examples of uh, 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 um, uh, what will happen. Looking at the human body as a huge or massive collection of uh, letters and codes, uh, a, a book of life, uh, etc. It uh, uh, transformed this body into a number of digits, a number of letters, and a store of information. Information that our ancestors uh, never had access to before. This is what Francis Collins said. He said we are the, the fortunate to be the first generation to have access to what he called language of God. The language of God here, he means this, this book, the letters in this book, how he created us. So uh, 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 we started to have um, uh, access to this digital version that was in the computer. Uh, we either didn't know that it exists or even when we knew that it exists, we didn't have access to. Now we have access to. The more information we have <clears throat> is not always, doesn't always mean the easier it will be. Sometimes uh, you have a problem because you have lack of information, and sometimes you have an, an, an equally problematic issue, and sometimes even more problematic when you have access uh, to a huge amount of information, much more than what you need. So when we have the genome of, 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 uh, of a human being, we have access not only to the health condition and the underlying uh, 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 symptoms or underlying conditions of the disease. No, we have access to the past of this person, the ancestors, and we can go back as uh, thousands of years, uh, as old as thousands of years, to know the ancestry and the origins of this of this person. And of course, this will have huge impact. Imagine that if there are uh, groups of people. They are fighting with each other uh, who are the original inhabitants of this land. Okay, through genomics, we sequence the genomes of these people, and then we know who is older in, in this land, who belongs to this land, because we can go back to thousands and thousands of years. 
okay, when we have the results of this study, what will happen politically speaking? And we had examples and some of the uh, papers were stopped and obstacles in the review process or even after because of the political uh, consequences, because we know uh, the past of the people that we couldn't know before. Uh, also, we can know the future. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to the advances in genetics and genomics, uh, we can know uh, with varying levels of certainty and probability, sometimes close to certainty, sometimes very far from, uh, we know what can happen to this person uh, once we sequence the genome. So I, I, we can have a person who looks quite well, uh, but we can know, look, there is a very high probability that this person will have an incurable disease and it is a lethal disease. So this person will die after reaching the age of 40 or 50. And through, for instance, Huntington disease. And when we discover the gene mutation responsible for the Huntington disease, we know that this person, more than 90%, will die because of this um, uh, 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 gene mutation. Uh, and uh, the person will simply die in because of this disease and it is incurable. There are no symptoms. The person is not sick. There is nothing wrong. Uh, but still, we can make these predictions. And now we have what they call predictive medicine. Not, not only preventive medicine and curative medicine, but predictive medicine. We can even do more. Uh, we can know and anticipate uh, the uh, um, possible diseases that will hit the prospective children of a certain couple before they have children. That's why we have, for instance, here in Qatar and uh, all Gulf countries, uh, uh, it's mandatory to have premarital genetic screening for the two pre-married couples so that you can register your marriage, for instance. Why? Because we know that if X and Y got married to each other and the they have these genes or these genomes, and it's likely or unlikely, we can measure this and we can predict it, that their children will have genetic diseases or not. And then we can advise the couple by saying that your marriage will probably lead to children with genetic diseases or you are safe, you are okay, you can get married, there is no, uh, the likelihood of having X or Y genetic diseases is not there or is very low, etc. So, what should we do with this huge amount of information that we have for the first time? This is an ethical dilemma. And this is not the role of the geneticists. This is not the role of the physicians. This is the role of the moral philosophers, the religious scholars, and people uh, who advise uh, on ethical issues and philosophical issues. So this created, of course, a new space of inquiry for uh, whether secular ethics moral philosophy or religious ethics, including Islamic ethics. Why all this happened? Because of the magnificent and unprecedented amount of information that we are exposed to, that we have access to because of the genomic uh, revolution. Uh, later, so up to 2001, 2003, uh, we started to know the book. Hmm? So we started to know, look, the disease you have is that because of the problem in the word school, eh? that is in your, in your genome, it's written skull. So there is a problem in the ACTGs, you know, these four digits or four numbers uh, that's getting repeated all the time that make up our uh, genome. Uh, so uh, when you don't have the, the normal sequence or normal order of ACTGs, this can cause uh, diseases. So we know it. So we have the information. Now uh, 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 we can uh, uh, um, rewrite the word, hmm? like what we do now on the on the word document that we delete the EA and put the OO. So we will fix the skull to be school. This is what we call gene editing. Later we had other terms like gene therapy. Um, <clears throat> genetic engineering, uh, genetic intervention. Now, the, the most common term we use is the gene editing. So, th through this, uh, our DNA structure, we can, we can take some stuff, we replace it with some stuff, we change uh, some letters, etc. And we have now prime editing and all these technologies in which we can get into the digital file and we change things. 
So it's not any more ethical management of information that we have, how to deal with this information, who should have access to this information. Should we tell the patients or the prospective patient or these uh, to be married couples about this information or their families, etc.? This is all ethical management of information. Here it's ethical management of action. Uh, uh, um, as we say in ethics, not everything doable is to be done. So have, uh, when we have the technology to do something, it doesn't mean that it becomes automatically ethical to do it. Not at all. Uh, we can lie all the time. We have this capacity as humans to lie and we use the same muscles and the same uh, organs uh, to do. So when I speak the truth, I use my tongue and when I lie, I use my tongue. But this doability doesn't mean that lying is possible. Uh, uh, for instance, a religious scholar, uh, religious people cannot say, oh, but God created this uh, tongue for me and uh, he made it possible for me to tell lies. So nobody would argue uh, in, in this way. So doability, you know, having the technique that we can edit people's genomes or people's genes, the small parts of the genome, doesn't mean that we can do it. We have to ask ourselves first, is it ethical or not? How to answer these questions? Because we are not working at the level of the organs that we see and that medicine uh, has tested for centuries before. We have an accumulated knowledge about how these organs uh, 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 work. And these organs are a limited in number. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter how many they are, but they are not as many as the billions of the, of the, of the, of the letters in our book of life or in our DNA. And uh, when you try to fix, imagine that you have a file of, uh, let's say, um, uh, one billion letter. And you will change uh, the two letters, uh, skull, to make it school. Uh, when you change these two letters, there is a possibility that when you do that, that some 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 letters and some words and even some sentences would move from their place to go to, for instance, the next line, the line afterwards. So the whole the the, the structure of the whole file may change. This is what happens also in our genome. When you try to fix some letters, it can have effects on other letters. The the very famous example uh, that we. Uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Hay, uh, who made um, edited uh, the gene responsible for um, uh, having AIDS. Uh, some people have a gene mutation that makes them uh, immune to having the AIDS gene. So he created this gene mutation in them. Uh, now we know that what he did uh, it may have impact on our uh, neurological functions. Uh, so you are doing something somewhere, but there is what we call off-target uh, uh, impact um, outside this letter or this sentence that you are doing it, it can uh, um, be done uh, somewhere else that you never imagined in, in your body. So it, this is ethical management of action. And again, the dilemmas uh, produced by these technologies are quite um, challenging. Uh, multi-dimensional and very complex uh, that uh, no one group, whether they are the best experts in uh, genetics or genomics or moral philosophy or religion, whatever, alone can do it. It needs it needs uh, uh, collaboration of different people. Uh, we have uh, Jennifer Downda or Downdra, uh, who got the uh, la latest um, Nobel Prize. Uh, for um, um, uh, developing CRISPR Cas9, uh, the tool, this tool that can make us ch make changes in the in the genome. Uh, when she made this discovery, she gave a very famous uh, talk in which she, she said, "She said, I need help from other people to tell me uh, how far we can go with this tool, for instance." Uh, so um, uh, these are just examples. Uh, to uh, give you a very rough, uh, simple, and to a certain extent, even a simplistic idea about what uh, genomics, the new field of genomics, uh, um, what kind of ethical challenges, ethical problems, ethical questions raised, uh, not only for uh, Muslims uh, or for religious people, but every human being. We, we all have genomes. 
And uh, at one point uh, in our time, uh, I think it's getting sooner and sooner uh, that when you visit the physician, uh, you will have your DNA in your file. And the doctor will talk with you about your um, 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 genome sequencing and uh, how far uh, the medicine can be tailored for you based on that. So we will have these. We have already the premarital genetic testing. We have the prenatal, antenatal genetic screenings, all this stuff. It's part of our um, uh, routine life uh, nowadays. So this is the uh, part, uh, the first part about the introductory works, uh, genomics, the genomic revolution, uh, uh, and how science uh, would impact the ethical discourse on um, uh, this uh, type of biomedical advancement or the new genomic revolution that we had. Do you have any questions about this part? Uh, Dr. Mohammed, there doesn't seem to be any questions at this point. So I think your presentation okay. is very comprehensive. Okay. So shall we shall we move to and um, take a little breathe and um, go to the next one? Sure. Okay. But it's important that you uh, uh, don't work uh, through uh, the replacement mechanism. So that we have the first one, you throw it, and then we go to the next. It should be accumulative. So keep in mind what we already said in the first part because it's a uh, building upon uh, each other uh, uh, you remember uh, what i said that the, the, the questions raised by uh, uh, genomics uh, are complex multidimensional and and very difficult the puzzle is very complex that not only one person or one group of specialists can can solve it alone uh, so, uh, 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 we need more than one expert on the table uh, to discuss these issues and to come to uh, reasonable uh, conclusions about these ethical dilemmas and the way forward. Uh, this is what we call in bioethics interdisciplinary discussions. We have people from more than one discipline. In the Islamic uh, discourse, uh, we have mainly, so we have more than one group, but mainly two group, uh, two groups uh, are um, um, representing more or less the mainstream stakeholders in these discussions. One group are the biomedical scientists, specifically those who are specialists in um, genetics and genomics, and the second one, of course, the religious scholars. Uh, this is, of course, in the Islamic discourse, is a new development. Mm -hmm. uh, throughout history, uh, religious scholars used to uh, consult uh, scientific knowledge uh, whenever it's relevant. It's not, not something new. We have a very uh, classical example about using uh, water heated by the sun, al mushammas we call it in Arabic, and whether this is uh, harmful or not for the skin. And um, many religious scholars would say, okay, this physician said that, uh, physicians that I know are of the opinion that, etc. So uh, they would consult this. Uh, but uh, um, uh, what we have today is something quite different because uh, things are not as simple as they were in the past. Also, religious scholars of the modern time uh, do not have uh, the encyclopedic knowledge that their predecessors had because before modernity, Education was by default interdisciplinary. So you would have religious scholars who studied medicine, and you would have physicians uh, who studied uh, Islamic law, fiqh, for instance, or theology. And if you look at uh, um, uh, biographical dictionaries uh, in Islamic history, you will see that. So you will see, for instance, Ibn al Nafis, uh, um, uh, very famous physician, uh, also in the biographical dictionaries of the Shafi'i school. For instance, uh, you will see the famous philosopher and physician Averroes Ibn Rushd uh, in the biographies of the Maliki uh, uh, jurists. And he was not just a jurist, he was also a judge. Um, and he wrote a very famous book, Bidayat al Mujtahid wa Nahat al Muqtasid, translated now into English as Jurists Premier. So uh, uh, you had uh, these people, but in, um, with the coming of modernity, we moved to um, the walls separating between the disciplines. Uh, not only 
religious sciences and biomedical sciences, but even within religious sciences and within biomedical sciences, so you will have a physician who is specialist only in heart or a specific part of the heart, someone in kidney, someone uh, in bones, etc. cetera. Uh, so with this specialization, sub-specializations, you don't have this encyclopedic person who can look at these multidimensional issues by himself or herself. So we cannot do anything else uh, but uh, um, uh, that religious scholars have to collaborate with uh, non-specialists in religious sciences. Um, uh, outside al uh, 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 and they would come together and they would issue um, uh, resolutions, recommendations, and fatwas together. I wrote about this phenomenon in one of my articles entitled Biomedical Scientists as Co-Muftis. We have this phenomenon nowadays that you have muftis and we, we have what we may call co-muftis also as well. So interdisciplinary uh, discussions. These interdisciplinary discussions were institutionalized in three main transnational institutions in the Muslim world. Uh, 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 the most famous and most active in the field of bioethics is the Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences. We call it IOMS. Established, to, adopted this name officially in 1984, although they started their work since 1980s. 1984, they got this official name. Uh, this organization or this institution, they do nothing but discussing bioethical issues. So they don't, they don't discuss, for instance, politics. They don't discuss family affairs. They don't discuss divorce or marriage. Or, it's only issues related to bioethics. Uh, but they collaborate with two other institutions uh, that uh, speak about sharia or fiqh in our modern time in the broad sense of the term. So all issues, politics, uh, economics, finance, uh, um, uh, marriage, divorce, etc., and among others, bioethical issues. When is the Islamic Fiqh Academy established 1977 in Mecca, and it is affiliated with the Muslim World League. Uh, and the other one is the International Islamic Fiqh Academy established 1981 in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. As you see, uh, the three institutions are based in the Gulf, one in Kuwait and two in Saudi Arabia. But these institutions are not Gulf institutions. They are Islamic institutions, transnational in nature. So uh, all Muslim countries are represented in their works uh, and in their proce the proceedings and the discussions that they have on these issues. Uh, especially uh, the, Oregon, the institution in Kuwait and the one in Jeddah, uh, they include also the different um, um, so, yeah, but we say schools of thought also, modern schools of thought. So you will have the Sunnis, you will have the Shia, you will have the Ibadis um, uh, represented in their, in their discussions as well. You will have scholars from Iran, you will have scholars from Lebanon, from Iraq. Uh, so uh, these are transnational in character and representing the Muslim world. And sometimes also, um, uh, um, um, uh, countries where you have uh, large Muslim minorities, like India, for instance, uh, most of the time is represented, and uh, also some um, uh, European uh, countries uh, and uh, scholars also from the United States, uh, representing uh, Muslim communities in these countries as well. So it's quite transnational in institutions. Uh, uh, and these institutions uh, have, of course, the religious scholars. These are the members of these institutions who are doing their work regularly, but they make a use of uh, this interdisciplinary approach, what we call it collective ijtihad, al ijtihad al um, uh, by uh, uh, involving uh, other specialists, especially. Those in economics and finance, when it comes to Islamic finance, the Muil Islami, as they call it, and when it comes to Islamic bioethics or al akhlaq tubbi. For the first, you have uh, uh, bankers, uh, you have uh, professors in finance, in commerce, etc. And for the later, for bioethics, you will have biomedical scientists on the table. These institutions discussed, among others, of course, the issues related to genomics and genetics. 
um, uh, the, the discussions between uh, 1993 and 2013 uh, throughout these uh, uh, 20 years, uh, they had um, in my own calculation, which is shouldn't be really comprehensive, about 15 conferences uh, and meetings, which is quite a lot. Uh, for instance, to just to give you an example, the issue of human cloning, for instance. It was a big deal in the 1990s, especially after cloning uh, Dolly, the sheep. Uh, they had two conferences and then they came to a conclusion. Uh, 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 but here we have 15. Hmm? Uh, so uh, this means that uh, uh, reflects how uh, complex and how difficult it is. And in some, maybe even many conferences, they, they couldn't come to an agreed upon uh, a concluding statement. So they would say, no, this means that we need to discuss this issue a bit further and more. And we have to commission other authors from the biomedical scientists, from religious scholars to address this issue a bit more in depth, et cetera, et cetera. The first conference that adopted uh, the uh, interdisciplinary approach or the collective, the mechanism of collective HD had, uh, uh, this is by case of coincidence. Uh, we are just here in Doha, but the first conference I have seen was here in Doha. Uh, um, uh, as you see here, uh, the uh, ethical implications of modern research in genetics. الانعكاسات الأخلاقية للأبحاث المتقدمة في علم الوراثة. It was organized at Qatar University, the host of this uh, event. Uh, this was 1993, and it was the College of Science at this time. It was not yet the science in humanities, I think now. It was at this time still the College of um, uh, Science, and they uh, invited a large number of uh, uh, experts in both uh, religious sciences, and in biomedical sciences. And the proceedings of the conference uh, are published in both English and Arabic, as you see it. Unfortunately, the, um, the, the published um, uh, proceedings are not available, so this is a call for Qatar University and Qatar University Press uh, in particular uh, to pay attention. This is an important piece in the history of Islamic bioethics, modern and contemporary Islamic bioethics, so it will be great if they can uh, republish uh, these uh, proceedings and make them available to researchers uh, uh, worldwide. So the discussions started 1993. Uh, of course, uh, we uh, legitimately can ask why 1993 in particular? Why not earlier, for instance? Uh, this has to do with the Human Genome Project, uh, which is the which has crystallized uh, the, our um, genomic revolution in the modern time. The Human Genome Project started 1990. And of course, this was big news. It was seen, as we will see later in following slides, as the biggest uh, biomedical scientific venture in human history. Uh, it, the, the, the project was led by Qatar University, sorry, uh, the project was led by the United States of America, uh, but uh, many uh, countries were involved, scientists from all over the world. It was a mega project, of course. So uh, this is started, the, 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 the news started in uh, 1990 uh, to prepare for the conference. It takes time and of, to reach uh, the news to you, uh, it takes time. So 1993 was quite um, uh, early, uh, I would say, uh, to discuss the ethical issues uh, related to uh, the incoming uh, uh, revolution in uh, 1993. And I really appreciate the efforts of the people who were there at this time uh, uh, and who thought of um, doing that. Uh, since 1993, we have many uh, uh, conferences, especially by the organizations I told you about. Uh, here on the left side, you see uh, one of the important um, uh, conferences in held in 1998. It's about, um, if I say the title in English, it's about genetic engineering, genetics, human genome, 
and gene therapy and Islamic perspective. So it discussed the, the, the whole new field uh, of genetics, genomics, genetic engineering, gene therapy, which will later be uh, um, more used with overlap, of course, and with some nuances with gene editing, etc. This was 1998. Uh, since since this conference, most of the conferences that followed were more or less um, like a response or follow up or reaction, agreement, disagreement with the conclusions of this conference or, or this symposium held in 1998 by the Islamic Organization for Medical Sciences in Kuwait. Uh, 2006, more or less uh, the same themes uh, where uh, the subject uh, of a, a symposium also organized by the IOMS in Kuwait, uh, but they um, involved uh, people from other perspectives. So it was not only about Islam, not only an Islamic perspective, uh, but uh, much broader. So they brought uh, people from Christianity, from Ju Judaism, people from uh, secular uh, bioethics, etc. They came together in uh, 2006. And uh, since then, we had uh, many, many conferences up to 2013, as we uh, talk about. Uh, what happened in these discussions between 1993 till 2013? There was uh, two main positions that we can we can speak roughly speaking about two main positions among the participants in these discussions. Uh, 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 the advocates of the two positions agreed on one thing that there is an incoming revolution. Science will not be the same as it is. And uh, uh, by extension, ethics, including Islamic ethics, will not be the same as it was before this shift making moment in history. So they spoke about the uh, uh, human genome project as the biggest scientific revolution ever, which is coming and happening at a moment where science and scientific research in the Muslim world is not in its best state. It's even in a deplorable state. And they said that uh, the current efforts, uh, here they are speaking about the, human, um, uh, about the Human Genome Project. The current effort to map and sequence the entire human genome is without doubt, and this is literally taken from the conclusions of the first conference in 1993, is without doubt the most significant and ambitious undertaking of biological research in modern time. So we speak about shift making moments in the history of science. We speak about the biggest projects in modern human history or in human history ever. That is the human genome project. So we have something big. They all agreed about that. But how to deal with this big event or revolution uh, um, uh, at, at the front door. What should we do with that? A group of uh, uh, participants, uh, especially uh, religious scholars who participated in this, they uh, adopted a precocious approach. They, they were quite cautious. Uh, so they were inclined to say it's better to wait, anticipate, and not to get involved in this revolution at this early time because we don't know what can happen in the near or in the far future. Uh, the um, uh, how much time do we still have? We still have uh, an hour. An hour. Okay. Uh, uh, um, I, I would have liked to uh, speak about some details, but uh, I will not get into these details. L maybe in the discussion round, if you want to take some technicalities about the theological discussions, etc. Those who participated in these discussions based their arguments, uh, the advocates of both positions, on arguments coming from Islamic theology, from Islamic law, and from their understanding uh, of the relationship, or now the new relationship between science and religion. In Islam, Islamic theology is a scholarly discipline that uh, um, um, uh, focuses on God, the nature of what is God. And how does God relate to us as humans and to other creatures, um, uh, etc.? Uh, so uh, they they said that uh, uh, 
we have now the possibility, it seems, uh, if we are speaking in the 90s still, uh, uh, that we can sequence the whole human genome, that we will have access to the entire um, uh, version of the human genome, that we can read it, we can sequence it, and who knows what will happen later on uh, of what we can do. Uh, no, nothing of this would happen outside the, the will of God. So for sure, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this to happen and he gave the permission to this happen in our uh, generation. So nothing happens beyond uh, God's will. But when it happens, it doesn't mean that we can do everything because uh, when God's uh, permit things to happen in our life, uh, we, are, we also have human responsibility or, or religious obligation, taklif. Hmm? We can kill people but we shouldn't. Uh, we can deceive people, but we shouldn't. We can lie, but we shouldn't, etc. So it, it doesn't mean that when God gives us the capacity or the ability to do something that we can do it. Uh, uh, and they discussed a lot about, uh, for instance, how would God permit, for instance, those who do not believe in him, uh, um, atheists, for instance, to be in advance uh, or before Muslims to reach to that, etc., was uh, also a, a big uh, discussion and they had their own uh, justifications. Uh, but uh, about uh, when it comes to Islamic law or fiqh, it's about the act. Hmm? It's not about theorizing what God is. It's about as a human being, what should I do and what I shouldn't do. When they spoke about fiqh, they spoke about the higher objectives of Sharia. This is a very famous concept, Maqasid Sharia in Islam, uh, which tells us uh, uh, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why did God uh, send uh, the revelation or the scriptures to the humans? What does God want from us? Um, uh, the uh, traditional theory is that there are five things to be achieved. Uh, by by the lawgiver with with an uppercase ill by al musharra or shara that's god allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to preserve people's religion preserve people's life preserve people's intellect uh, 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 property and offspring these are the five big things for which sharia was sent to the people not only islam but to all other religions that were sent to the people through god's prophets he said that uh, if we want to uh, classify uh, genomics, where does it fall in, in these five? Uh, they said it seems it's for protecting offspring. In Nestle, that we have children born with genetic diseases, uh, so uh, genomics would come in so that we will predict these diseases. We tell the to be uh, uh, married couples or the um, uh, already married couples, what to do with their children, genetic screening, etc., etc. Of course, this was a limited understanding, a bit uh, more limited than what we mentioned now, because this was what they could understand at this time in the 1990s. So they said it's, it falls within the um, uh, uh, preservation of the offspring, future generations. And they said when it comes to this particular uh, higher objective of Sharia, it means that uh, the general rule is that everything is prohibited unless. Uh, we have a very famous rule in Islam which speaks about presumption of permissibility or original permissibility. In principle, everything, especially when it is beneficial, everything is permissible unless we have a good reason to decide otherwise. So we don't have to find every time a textual reference in the Quran or in the Sunnah or on what the scholars wrote telling us that this is halal, that this is permissible. No, we should find something there to tell us that it is not, because if we don't have, it means it is permissible. They said this general rule does not apply here. Why? Because uh, genomics is coming to protect future generations, uh, to get future uh, offspring, and to get children in Islam, it's only about marriage. Uh, and uh, in marriage, everything is prohibited unless. So, for instance, uh, 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 um, if I want to get children, I cannot get children with any woman. 
it's prohibited unless this woman is married with me. I, I am married with this woman. So they said, we will use the rule of original prohibition. So we have to stop uh, trying anything until we are sure that it is permissible. Okay, how do we know that it is permissible or not? It's the benefit harm assessment. Some of the, uh, when, they, when they review the possible harms and benefits based on what they read, what they hear from the biomedical scientists, etc., uh, they would uh, propose, uh, what do we have? Some of the religious scholars who spoke about this, you would see, for instance, one page speaking about the benefits, which is about treating diseases. That's it, or preventing them. But when uh, they speak about the harms, you see very extensive. Yeah? So it, in, in one of the papers, you see one page for the benefits and 10 pages for the harms. So they will speak about medical harms, social harms, uh, ethical harms, et cetera, psychological, uh, uh, psychosocial harms, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they would say that it, it is clear to us, uh, the, the advocates of this position, that we, have, we can have more harms than the benefits. That's why we have to be quite cautious. Uh, uh, about this and alert the, the relationship between science and religion also. They said that the, rela the relationship between science and religion at this moment in our history is one of the worst relationships uh, uh, because uh, science is divorced from religion. And uh, some, even of the scientists uh, who participated in the discussions, they, he said that scientists of today, they have no religion to abide by. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, except uh, their scientific imagination. That, that's their religion. They have no other religion. They are not afraid of God. They are not afraid of the hereafter, nothing. Uh, also, some uh, recalled the notorious example of nuclear energy. Nuclear energy at its time uh, also was a big uh, scientific uh, leap and, uh, and breakthrough. Uh, it ended up uh, being misused uh, uh, massively, uh, led to using it twice in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Millions of people uh, have been victims, either uh, in the number of deaths, the number of casualties, uh, the number of injured, the, num the number of people who continue to have diseases for generations and generations, etc. So it's very clear that science can be misused if we don't have accompanying ethics or ethical uh, management. Uh, the, the bad thing, what makes things worse even in the eyes of the advocates of this position is that uh, the, the nuclear energy in the United States was uh, uh, led by the Manhattan Project. And this Manhattan Project is, is what became later U.S. Department of Energy. And this U.S. Department of Energy is the institution responsible for the Human Genome Project. So uh, there is a bad omen here uh, that... that uh, Manhattan Project is still in the box, is not, is not outside the box yet. Uh, and, uh, okay, in, in, this, in this dark imagination and dark scenario, uh, what should Muslims do? Then as Muslims, what should we do? He said, they said, we are not leaders. We are not leading this genomic revolution. So we actually, actually have no role to play in that. Uh, science will continue and will move forward. And we can we cannot ever uh, um, hold it back or say you do that you don't do that nobody will listen to us because we are not part of that we are just consumers etc. All what we care about what we should care about is that we tell our governments that when this technology comes to us and we are going to consume it there must be Sharia based safeguards the Wabichari that will tell us what to consume, what not to consume, etc. And we shouldn't make any concessions in this regard. So this was one position. The other, the other position wa was very keen, the advocates of the other position, they were very keen to embrace a, 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 a genomic revolution, to be part of the genomic revolution, to get involved in the genomic revolution, and to play a proactive role, not waiting till the genomic revolution takes place and then we thinking what to consume and what not to consume. They, all, they also used the Islamic theology, um, Islamic law, fiqh, and the relationship between uh, uh, science and religion, etc. In short, uh, when it comes to theology, they said that uh, humans 
uh, since the, their beginning, since Adam السلام, they have been uh, um, in a long journey trying to know themselves better and better and better. A human genome uh, project is one of the important stations in this journey that now we can know ourselves better than we used to. So this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted throughout history and not only permitted but commanded us to do. Do not you complete into your own selves uh, as stated in the Quran, etc. So it's something very normal. And, and uh, uh, discovering uh, uh, God's laws in nature ha has nothing to do with religious affiliation. So Muslim should be first or non-Muslim should be first, etc. It's for those who work hard, uh, for those who look for the knowledge, who run after the knowledge. Uh, uh, and when Muslims did that uh, in their golden age, they were the ones in the uh, forefront. And if they are not working hard, God is just and fair. So he will not give it to the Muslims. Uh, being Muslim or non-Muslim is something for the hereafter. But for this life, there are laws in nature and you have to look for these laws in order to uncover them and discover them. And uh, those who are at the forefront in the race, they will be given uh, the privilege uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and then when it comes to Islamic law, they disagreed with the idea that uh, 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 genomics related to only offspring. They said, of course not. It's also for uh, uh, protecting one's life, uh, not only our own uh, children. And uh, they said uh, things closer to what I explained in the beginning. And so they said uh, it's not original prohibition, it's original permissibility. We have to stick to the general rule in Islam. Everything is permissible unless we have a good reason to say that it is not permissible. Okay, so it is generally permissible, but don't we have more harms than benefits? They said no, we don't have more harms than benefits. Okay, don't we have harms, possible harms anyhow? They said yes, possible. And uh, it seems sure that we will come across some risks and some problems, uh, but what else in life? is free from possible harm. Pairing between uh, the, the harmful and the beneficial. We don't have all the time uh, only beneficial or only harmful. Uh, most of the time, We say that we cannot get children outside family and outside marriage. This is the Islamic position. So we cannot use genomics outside that. These things that we can uh, do and say. When it comes to the relationship between science and religion, they said, uh, uh, is science divorced from religion? They said, yes, to a certain extent, maybe to a great extent, yes. But does this mean that science is divorced from ethics? This is not necessarily. And, and, and some of the participating uh, uh, participants in these uh, conferences who were uh, coming from countries where Muslims live as religious minorities like Europe and the United States, they themselves are Muslims, they come from Muslim countries. They said, I have seen uh, scientific research uh, uh, inside and outside uh, of the Muslim world. And I can tell you, they would say, some of them would say, uh, that uh, conducting research is subject to much uh, stricter uh, moral scrutiny in the non-Muslim world than in the Muslim world. So yes, science may be divorced from religion, but not necessarily is. And not completely also div divorced from uh, religion. Uh, we have, especially uh, genomics, has a good example. So they would speak about Francis Collins, uh, who was an atheist, and then he moved to uh, become a believer, especially in Christianity. 
And he said that he was the director of the of the Human Genome Project, and he is a very well established scientist. Uh, after finishing the Human Genome Project, he wrote a book called um, Language of God, uh, speaking about sequencing the genome and reading the letters of the of the Book of Life uh, genome. He called it Language of God. Uh, uh, so there are still scientists, big scientists, who are religious, who are uh, believers, etc. Um, uh, they would quote him like after two years of genomic contemplation, I found God in the human genome, uh, which to the best of my knowledge is not really authentic. Yeah? Um, um, uh, what I, I, I see in his own book and in uh, the works written about um, uh, Francis Collins, he did not become a believer because of the human genome project. Uh, he uh, his journey to become a believer started already, I think, while he was at the university, etc. But uh, of course, possibly working on the human genome project may have intensified um, his feeling of religiosity. He he always spoke about that the time he spent in the lab uh, working on the human uh, genome project uh, is um, uh, as uh, is, is is spiritually enriching for him as spending time in the church because in both cases he's worshiping God um, and stuff like this. And when it comes to the role for Muslims, they said we shouldn't ask the question: Do we have a role or do don't we have a role? We must have a role, and we don't have any option but to become part of this uh, ongoing or incoming revolution. And this is what we call in Islam fard kifaya, collective duty. As individuals, we have obligations. I have to pray five times a day. I have to fast when it is Ramadan. I have to go to pilgrimage. These are individual obligations, but there are collective duties and obligations like, like human welfare, taking care of the environment, uh, taking care of public health. These are collective obligations. And, and um, um, joining the genomic revolution, being part of the genomic revolution is one of the collective obligations and collective duties in Islam in our modern time. So it is for the kifay, it is part of the beneficial knowledge. It has a great benefit for the ummah because the, the Muslim uh, community, because if we don't have, if we are not part of this incoming revolution, we will not have our, we, we cannot maintain our independence in the future because the people who has this technology will be the people who will decide for the rest of the uh, humanity. So this is the second part. Any questions about this second part? If anybody has any questions, you can type them in the, the chat box. I think everybody's focused on the, the content and they haven't had questions. Okay. Shall we go to the third part, the applied example? Yes. Okay. Uh, I will try to be um, uh, concise here so that we uh, can have uh, some time for the discussion. Uh, uh, as I said, uh, the, the uh, genomic revolution opened for us the Pandora's box for the knowledge, for the information that we know about our bodies much more than our ancestors could, and also opened the Pandora's box for what we can do, how we can interfere in this body. Uh, uh, when it comes to interfering in the body, uh, the biggest applied example is human genome editing. We know that I think November or October uh, 2018, the Chinese uh, scientist, Dr. He, declared uh, uh, that uh, uh, the birth of the um, uh, first uh, uh, gene edited twin in history, Chinese twin girls, uh, um, whose genome uh, has been edited. And since then, um, we have a very big debate about human uh, genome editing. The lady or the two ladies uh, who uh, developed the CRISPR-Cas9 CRISPR, uh, CRISPR um, uh, that is uh, the most important tool now for uh, editing um, uh, human genomes. They got uh, the latest uh, Nobel Prize for what um, uh, they have uh, done. I think uh, some of the statistics about their paper in which they introduced 
the CRISPR uh, CRISPR Cas technology says that uh, I think they published 2008 the paper uh, they said that the paper uh, has been cited uh, at, at the frequency of once per eight hours mm -hmm. every eight hours the paper was uh, cited once with this rate so uh, it's the big thing now in um, um, in uh, in our modern time. Uh, to speak about human genome editing, of course, it was not part directly of the discussions in the 1990s and the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, but when we spoke about gene therapy in some futuristic topics, we can get some glimpses and ideas about how Muslim religious scholars think about human genome editing. So this is what I will try to summarize and sum up in this last part of my lecture. Uh, they agreed, it, it, uh, started from some starting points. Uh, first of all, dignity of God's creatures, mm -hmm. uh, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created um, uh, has a dignity. It has life and it must be respected. But the cream of God's creation are uh, the humans. Uh, so uh, the human dignity uh, um, is something special, morally speaking, is something special. So uh, uh, this dignity uh, has, as, as, as a consequence of the human dignity, human body has a special dignity and it must be dealt with respect. For instance, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said uh, that uh, uh, breaking the bones uh, of the dead is as, uh, uh, is as prohibited as breaking uh, the bones of the living. So even if we are dead, our bodies also must be treated with respect. So religious scholars said uh, um, um, genome editing or gene therapy at this time is something new. We are not yet sure about the um, um, possible impact, whether it's beneficial or harmful, etc. So uh, the general rule that we have to say is that uh, safety, and efficacy uh, are always a condition that we are what we are doing is reasonably safe and it, it has efficacy so so it will it likely produce something beneficial uh, and this beneficial outcome will be uh, much more important than the possibly harmful side effect so no question about that another thing related to human dignity is taking informed consent from the person, because you cannot interfere in my human body without my uh, uh, without my consent. Uh, uh, this was uh, mentioned in early uh, Islamic discussions under the term permission al uh, That and, and we have some legal maxims about this. No one can infringe upon another human's body without uh, uh, one's permission. Uh, and uh, even if this person was a physician. Uh, and even if the physician has a good intention uh, to treat me, for instance, have to get my permission. This is what we now call informed consent, more or less, with some nuances. So these things must be respected in all cases and at all times, and these things should be uh, regulated uh, and implemented, whose details should be implemented by uh, the respective scientists and physicians. Beyond that, they said we have to ask two important questions. And the answers to these questions would determine for us whether human genome editing will be judged as something permissible, something good, or as something bad, evil, or prohibited. The first one, what are we going to edit? Because we can edit the, type of, the types of cells, we can edit the genome in a somatic cell, or we can edit the genome in a germline cell. Somatic cells, these are the cells uh, uh, that do not uh, reproduce us. Uh, it is not used for human reproduction. Like, for instance, my skin cells, my kidney cells, my liver cells, my eye cells. These are cells that do not reproduce uh, humans later. But germline cells are the reproductive cells. For, for the males, these are the sperms. And for the females, these are the eggs. Or when the egg is fertilized, then we speak about the embryo. 
So if we speak about, uh, uh, we are going to edit a somatic cell, the gene in a somatic cell. This should be uh, easier, much easier when we to judge it, to say that you can go ahead. Yes, will be easier. Why? Because we make it an analogy with the organ. Okay? So we interfere in the organ in order to improve someone's health condition or to restore health for the person. Uh, and uh, we do that uh, uh, not at the at the at the phenotype level, but at the genotype level in the genes of these cells, should be okay. Also, another important thing is that we can get the informed consent of the person because this is my eye, this is my uh, um, uh, arm, this is my brain, so I can give informed consent. Unlike the germline cells, which which uh, whose case is much more controversial than the somatic cell. Why? Because in the in in when we interfere in the germline cell and we edit genes, these genes will remain in the offspring of that person. Okay? So 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 uh, we speak about generations to come, uh, not about a cell in a specific organ. So we need to ask the question, how far we can go as humans, our human agency? Uh, can, can we as humans decide the destiny of generations to come? Here, the question becomes a bit more difficult. Also, uh, when we decide for these future generations who did not come yet, we did not consult with these future generations. They are not yet here. They are not in a position to give their consent about this is something good or bad, etc. Does this completely close the door and say it tells us it's impossible to do it? No, because they said uh, uh, we, can, we we still have authority over our children as parents, as guardians, and we can decide for them many things, uh, even their education, even their religion, etc. So we can, but. It's not like the um, uh, um, uh, it's not like it's not like the somatic cell. So this is the first question. What are we going to it? The second question is why? Why are we going to do that? And this raises the question about the telos of medicine. We spoke uh, just before about the objectives of Sharia, but medicine has also objectives. And uh, throughout history, usually medicine has two main objectives. A preventive objective hmm, protects us from disease before it comes, hmm, preventive medicine, or a curative purpose that it will treat the body once the disease starts. These are usually the two big objectives of uh, medicine. Uh, now we will see that the other objectives are on the horizon, they are coming also. So they said if we are doing this for treatment, so we have a disease and, and we want to treat it. There is no other way for uh, um, treating it. This should be okay. In principle, this should be okay. As we are treating the organs, the human organs, we can also treat uh, human genes or parts of the, of the uh, genome. Uh, uh, but if there is no underlying disease, then there is we cannot talk about treatment, but here we are speaking about enhancement. So I have normal eyes, but I want to see much further than what I am now. I want to see at the distance of 50 kilometers. And the gene editing will help doing that. This this is not treatment because because there is no disease. I'm I'm not like the, an average uh, human being. So this is enhancement. Or I won't be able to memorize the Quran in an overnight. Uh, memorizing the Quran usually takes years, a couple of years, uh, with very hard working. Uh, but if if we can do that uh, and and improve. Uh, the 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 capacities of uh, memorizing uh, to that extent. Why not? Again, this is not treatment. This is enhancement. And here you had this agreement among religious scholars. And to my mind, this happened. This this agreement happened because they had different understandings of our human nature. Some thought that 
and each would take uh, some uh, references in the Quran or in the Sunnah to approve to prove their position. Some thought that uh, we we have been created. Our human nature is the best possible option. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala created us in the best possible way. And whatever, whenever we try as humans to interfere in this nature, we just make it worse because we are not gods. So we have to accept it as it is, and we interfere only when it goes outside the normal course of events, the natural course. We get sick. Okay, then we restore it. That's it. Beyond that, as long as it's working, we don't interfere. This is one group. The other group thought, no, we have been created with the best possible potential. We have the potential to go bitter and bitter and bitter and bitter. And God lifted to us to uh, discover the ways of how to improve our nature in different ways and, and, and through different mechanisms. And he said, we are changing our nature in many different ways, like education. Those who go to school, those who do not go to school, see how much difference happens between them. We are interfering in, in, in human nature and we are improving that. So uh, they said that enhancement in principle can also be okay, eh? less than in, in degree than treatment, less urgent than treatment, but it doesn't mean that if it is not treatment, then it is uh, for sure uh, uh, prohibited or crossed out. But we have to ask the following question, uh, what are we going to enhance and why? So for instance, enhance in, enhancement in order to memorize the Quran, why not? Uh, uh, but enhancing people so that they can be uh, much more skillful, let's say in lying or in deceiving people, they're not, and so on. So uh, uh, to sum up, uh, uh, the issue of um, uh, human genome editing, uh, you will find some uh, items uh, acceptable as long as the scientific problems are solved, the scientific problems of safety and efficacy. That the, the what question is answered by we are editing genes in somatic cells. And why question is that we are doing that for treating diseases, especially diseases that are incurable and uh, they, they, they are life-threatening diseases. We don't have any other way uh, but to uh, use the um, uh, human uh, genome editing. You would find uh, quite considerable number of religious scholars who would support that. Uh, other cases will be much more controversial. Uh, like, for instance, uh, we will uh, edit uh, genes in germline cells, in embryos, in eggs, or in uh, sperms, uh, um, but we will do it for treatment. Uh, so uh, using it for treatment will make it okay, but for germline cells will make it controversial. Uh, the most problematic one, if we are going to do, for instance, uh, editing genes in germline cells, and we do it for the sake of enhancement. You will find a great majority of religious scholars who will not um, uh, uh, support that. So this is the uh, part of the um, the third part that I had uh, today. Uh, these are uh, I end up with a number of slides about sources uh, that can give you uh, more um, um, information for those who are interested. This is an article uh, which I published in um, uh, issues in science and technology. A journal, uh, Islamic Ethical Perspective on Human Genome Editing. If not mistaken, it's 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 available on internet for free. You can download it. Uh, um, uh, these are uh, studies we made it for the World Innovative Summit for Health, Wish here in Doha. Uh, they are available in both English and Arabic. Uh, Genomics in the Gulf uh, Region and Islamic Ethics. Uh, this report or this study was about ethical management of incidental findings. Uh, uh, and this is the most comprehensive source, Islamic Ethics and the Genome Question. This is an edited volume uh, that we published, and it is also available on the uh, um, publisher's website. If you just Google uh, the name, you will find it. You can download the PDF uh, for free. So that's, uh, that, that's all what I had uh, uh, for my talk uh, today. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be very happy to answer as far as I can. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad.
Uh, we have our first question from Alan, and uh, he's, he's asking, according to Islamic ethics, are there any circumstances where gender selection may be permissible? Yes, uh, gender selection is one, one of the issues that come within the context of uh, prenatal uh, genetic screening. At the prenatal level, before implanting the uh, uh, before implanting the uh, the embryo in an, an IVF process into the uterus, we screen it, and during the screening process, we can discover the um, uh, embryos that have gene mutations, but we can also discover the uh, sex of the embryo. So we can choose we can we can know the male and the female. Uh, uh, can we do embryo selection at the basis of gender? The organizations I spoke about, uh, 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 one of them, the one in Mecca, they discussed this issue and they came to the conclusion that no, you cannot do that. Uh, because uh, simply, uh, uh, gender is not a disease. Uh, uh, to be a male or a female is something natural. We can all be female or female. So uh, uh, there is no treatment here. There is no treatment. It's, it's not like selecting an embryo uh, in order to avoid a disease. There is no disease. Here. This is one. Uh, the second uh, one, uh, they spoke about uh, uh, um, um, if we permitted that, uh, uh, we will disturb the natural balance uh, uh, between uh, males and females in life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made in life. Uh, we know throughout history that even uh, at times, after times of war and pandemics, etc., uh, sometimes you have a gender, like in wars, um, uh, will uh, greatly suffer more than females, for instance. But then by time, nature will, uh, naturally, it will be self-corrected and then you have this uh, percentage uh, 49 51 more or less or 50 50 between the two so this will be interfering in uh, in the natural order that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made i can add to this uh, that if we speak in our region uh, like the arab world and also in other countries like india like china most of the time we are not speaking about gender selection we are speaking about male selection that people want to have boys and, and this is injustice, this is unfair. And if we speak about a disease, we speak about a disease in the mindset of the people who think so, not, not a disease in the embryo to be implanted in the, in the uterus. So simply they said, no, not possible. And I think here in Qatar is not possible, also legally speaking. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. We have, we have a second question. Um, yes. So, uh, what is the Islamic standpoint on abortion? Should an uncurable disease be identified in genetic screening? Okay, this is uh, this is another uh, big topic. If not mistaken, I, I have a lecture also at Qatar University, maybe College of Medicine or Pharmacy. I'm not sure. I, I will. I'll be speaking about abortion in a day or two. Uh, uh, but to put it simple uh, for the participants here, uh, religious scholars usually make a distinction, an important distinction between uh, 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 having abortion or do, asking for abortion before 120 days starting from the moment of uh, conception, from the moment of fertilization or after 120 days, because by 120 days we have the concept insolment in Islam. Uh, this is because references in the Quran and Sunnah uh, that uh, at the, during this period, after 120 days, uh, the human soul gets breathed into the embryo. So we don't have life, but we have human life from this moment. So up to 120, uh, uh, we have life that must be respected. So abortion can be justified uh, only if we have, have a religiously valid reason, they call it Uzr Shari. Uh, what, what makes a specific condition valid? For instance, genetic condition, is this a valid reason? 
Uh, religious scholars would disagree. So they, they agree that a valid reason would justify, but you would disagree what makes a specific reason religiously valid. Uh, one of the institutions I spoke about, they discussed the issue of genetic uh, um, conditions. Uh, um, they called it genetically malformed uh, embryos or something like this. In Arabic. And he said that before 120 days of pregnancy, it is possible under conditions. First of all, that we have a report signed by at least three specialists, three specialist physicians, saying that the condition is severe. And that uh, severe to the extent that it is even unlikely that pregnancy will continue. And even if pregnancy continued, uh, the life of the to be born baby, the quality of this life will be quite low and uh, uh, even quite short. And the burden on the parents and the surrounding family will be very heavy. All these conditions and the, the, the prospective parents, the husband and the wife ask, for, then you can do it. And I have seen in some correspondences with the hospitals inside and outside Qatar that they give this option through an ethics committee, uh, um, depending on the severity that will be decided on a case by case basis. After 120 days of pregnancy, uh, uh, the only uh, valid reason to terminate pregnancy is that if pregnancy continued, we have to choose between two lives, the life of the mother or that of the child, the baby. Then we give preference to the life of the mother because the life of the mother is certain and actual, but the life of the baby is a matter of probability and it is just potential life, not actual. This is in short. Any other questions? Hello? Can you hear me? Can I know I can, yes. Okay, yes. sorry. About so the first question is, is uh, look, is look enhancement through plastic surgery due to emotional distress permissible? Uh, sorry, is what? Uh, look enhancement, so like the appearance. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So that, that that's the first question. The second question is uh, slightly different. Is it no, different? no. The, the first the first question, uh, the, the appearance. Yeah. What are we going to do? With the appearance. The enhancement of the appearance um, by a uh, plastic, ah, plastic, plastic surgery. surgery. Plastic yeah. surgery. Oh, okay. Plastic surgery. Okay. Shall I is answer this, this one? Yeah, we'll go for that one first. Okay, so uh, for uh, plastic surgery, uh, religious scholars uh, differentiated between three levels, necessity, need, and enhancement or embellishment. Daruri, haji, tahsini. The need, uh, the necessity, I had an accident and my nose was broken and I want to uh, fix it to the, so that I will restore the original function. No question that it is permissible. The plastic surgery in this regard. The need, uh, someone who is born with that, uh, but it is abnormal. Uh, phenotypically speaking, the phenotype is abnormal, it's too big to, it's, uh, it's not normal, and we want to fix it. They would say also, yes, possible. Uh, the problem with the people who are not satisfied, hmm? so I'm not satisfied with my nose, even if it's not too big. I want to have it that way, or my um, teeth, or my, I don't know what, uh, anything I'm not satisfied with. Here is the issue. Uh, um, uh, to be honest with the discussions of the religious scholars, most of the time they will say, uh, for non-married for non-married women, they shouldn't. For married women, they can do it if it is with the permission or the request of the husband. So this is this is these are the discussions and this is what they say. If I may say my opinion, humble opinion, uh, I think um, 
uh, we need also to be critical about these discussions that the participants are dominantly male, like myself. So we have this bias, this male bias. Um, I think if uh, um, uh, there was a better balance in the participants and we had more female voices, um, uh, like the voices I hear in my family from my wife and my children, uh, the, the you would know that uh, it's it's not that simple. Huh? Uh, because when a woman, uh, at least many women, does this, uh, they do it for their own selves. Not, not necessarily for tempting uh, someone if I'm not married or something like this. I just want to feel good. I just want to feel happy. Uh, stuff like this. Uh, so it's, it's not only married, uh, unmarried, and the permission of the husband, um, uh, etc. But I would here add something. Uh, that uh, um, interfering in the human body is, is, not, is, not, is not something easy because we are not the owners of our bodies. The owner of our bodies is the one who created them. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our capacity and our authority over our own bodies is limited because we are only trustees of human bodies. So whenever we want to do something in our bodies, even for treatment, like plastic surgery or whatever, uh, we shouldn't go too far uh, because uh, uh, you, you should make sure that you don't offend the owner. Like if you borrow a book from a library, uh, you borrow the, the book to read and not to uh, um, um, uh, cut it into pieces or not to uh, use it uh, as kitchen tissue or whatever. So uh, always ask yourself, uh, when, when you do that, are you displeasing the one who created your body? Uh, you are doing this uh, because you want to imitate uh, this or that uh, Hollywood star, or I don't know what. So uh, I, I don't mean by this uh, that it must be necessarily something bad, but um, there is uh, this uh, level of piety, uh, level of piety. When uh, the Prophet Sallallahu says, oh, your heart, istafti uh, qalbak. If you, if you feel okay, okay, then do it because you are who will be responsible for this. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, the next question is around, it's quite a, a general question, but it's around the alignment mm -hmm. of the various schools of thought within uh, in Islam around the, the bioethical issues that you've discussed today. I didn't get the question. About so, the different schools of thought? Yes, and how much alignment there is with the various bioethical issues you've discussed. Okay. Uh, as I said, um, in these collective ishtihad institutions, uh, uh, almost all schools of thought are uh, represented. I mean schools of thought among the religious scholars. For instance, we don't have secularists represented, we don't have atheists represented, etc. unless the conference would demand it, like, like the conference they had in collaboration with uh, um, secular uh, bioethicists and uh, Jewish and Christian bioethicists. But usually um, we have Sunni, Shia, Ibadi, etc. So quite diverse. If the question is about uh, how far these institutions agree or disagree with each other, I would say um, the norm is that they agree with each other because there is a coordina coordination. Most of the time, the discussions start by the organization in Kuwait. And once they have their discussions, then they would propose their recommendations to one of the two other institutions, especially the one in Jeddah, the International Islamic Fiqh Academy, and try to come to a consensus or semi-consensus most of the time. But sometimes there are disagreements, clear. Uh, like, for instance, brain death. The organization in Kuwait and the organization in Jeddah, they said it's accepted in Islam, and brain death is death <clears throat> from an Islamic perspective. But the one in Mecca, the institution in Mecca, did not accept brain death as death. So sometimes you have disagreement, but usually they, they try to find a common ground among each other. Um, this looks like the, the, the last question, unless anybody has any others. So, Mohammed, regarding uh, premarital screening, um, should there be a couple who go ahead with premarital screening and the tests reveal a high risk of genetic disorders, yet the couple want to go ahead and get married, 
Uh, what's the Islamic per, uh, perspective on, on this? Yes, according to the law uh, enforced in all uh, countries now uh, that use uh, premarital genetic screening as a prerequisite for registering any marriage, uh, it's informative. It's not binding. So you have to do the test and to know the results. But then to decide to go further with marriage or not, this is up to you. Even if it is a very high risk, uh, the, 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 they, will not, they will not forbid you from uh, getting married. Now about the ethical part, not the legal, the ethical part uh, is that uh, um, there are options, even if the risk is very high. Uh, people get married to get children, but not only because they want to get children, because they love each other. So they may decide not to get children. And if they want to get children, you don't have 100% uh, uh, rate of getting children with genetic diseases. So you can do it through IVF and you do prenatal, uh, um, um, genetic screening, antenatal, genetic screening, et cetera, and then you choose. So there are other options, but the fact that you know that there is a risk will help you in making options um, uh, 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 later on. So um, uh, having a high risk for getting children, does this mean that marriage will turn to be unethical or prohibited in Islam? I don't think so. And I didn't see any religious scholar who said that. But uh, you have to be aware of, of the consequences and you weigh them over well before you decide to get married or not. And I think there are now um, um, some empirical studies uh, uh, that measures the rate of the people once they know that uh, they have results telling them that they have high expected expectancy of getting children with marriage, that they proceed with marriage or not. Uh, as far as I see, the results are quite contradicting. So um, some results, for instance, are in Jeddah, others are in the Mam, some are here in Doha, etc. So they don't give us a uniform uh, or um, a specific diagram where, where people are heading to. Uh, that seems to be all of the questions that have been submitted to us, Dr. Muhammad. Um, unless anybody else has any further questions. It doesn't look like it. So, Dr. Muhammad, I just want to thank you once again for an excellent presentation. Um, oh, very, thank you. very informative. I'm sure we're all going to go away and we've we've learned a lot from your presentation. So, thank, thank you very much for, for joining us and uh, delivering this informative uh, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for having me and thanks for all those who were with us. And uh, I hope it was of benefit to everybody. Thank you so much. And have Thank a nice you. evening. Assalamu um, Before our participants leave, so to claim certification for today's session, for those who joined a little bit later, um, I will share my uh, screen with you. So just to talk you through how to claim the, the certification, there's been some questions. Um, so, you should be able to see my screen now, and uh, this is our CPD events page. So you can register for upcoming events. Our next ethics series is on Sunday. Um, this is interprofessional ethics towards a common framework. So to claim your um, CPD certification today, you just need to click on the link that's associated to the um, event. And that will take you to a short survey that you'll need to complete. Um, it will actually open in about 15 minutes. So you can do that in about 15 minutes. Um, the recording for today's session as well, it will be, be available from 8 p.m. this evening as well, should you want to uh, watch the session again. So thank you very much for, for joining us. And we invite your feedback and uh, participation in our future events. And uh, good night. Assalamu alaikum.